For more on foreign fighters joining the Islamic State, I'm joined by David Gartenstein Ross. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He also teaches at Georgetown University. Um, we just saw these last couple of pieces. Uh, it seems like they're coming from all over the place. Give us a face of these foreign fighters. Where are they coming from? What's the lure? There's a few countries that uh, have produced a lot of foreign fighters. One of them is uh, Tunisia. Uh, Libya, also um, Jordan has been a particularly high contributor as of Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. Uh, what's drawing them in is a number of different factors. For some of them, it's just looking at pictures of the Syrian conflict where the Assad regime has been brutalizing men, women, and children and being drawn there for uh, emotional or, or kinship type reasons. Uh, others have more of a, an extremist view that they bring into the conflict already. And uh, within the various fighter factions, the people who have a more extreme view tend to gravitate, obviously, towards the Islamic State, where their social media is broadcasting out beheadings and all sorts of atrocities. Well, let's talk a little bit about the social media component of this. Uh, Ryan Meltzer talking about the cyberspace element, uh, at least with Malaysia. Um, we've seen these slickly produced videos. They've got slickly produced uh, uh, documents as well. Um, is that a big part of this, or is it more just, are we looking at the wrong thing, I guess, maybe the question. Are we looking too much at IS and not necessarily at the people that are attracted? I think we're looking too much at IS and, and not at the various other groups that are drawing people in, but I do think social media plays a significant role. Uh, for one thing, um, IS's propaganda, as you said, it's very slick, it's very persuasive, and social media creates, creates much more immediacy. I think that's one of the reasons that compared to, say, the Iraq war when the U.S. first went in there, you have much more people who've been drawn to Syria and Iraq, to this battlefield, to groups like the Islamic State. We've heard about Al-Qaeda, now we've heard about IS. Recently we heard about Khorasan, which many people had never heard of before. How much of a threat are they? Are they also luring foreign fighters? Well, not just many people. I mean, for anybody who's relying on publicly reported information, uh, they literally had never been heard from until about a week or so before the bombing. Uh, it, uh, Khorasan is a big deal. Um, it's, uh, it was embedded with some of the rebel groups on the ground, uh, but is much more linked to al-Qaeda's core leadership in Pakistan. According to open source reporting, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the admir, had uh, sent a number of very senior people to, uh, to Syria. And um, included in this group are people who are acolytes of a very famous bomb maker in Yemen, Ibrahim al-Asiri, who keeps developing, de developing these innovations that really affect the lives of the audience. For example, um, he was the one who developed the bomb that in uh, late 2009, a young Nigerian brought on board a plane in his underpants, which uh, then led to full body scans. He's also had several other plots that have at least gotten bombs on board planes, although blowing up the plane has proven to be a little bit more elusive for him. Let me ask you about uh, getting these people into uh, Syria. Um, and there's the concern, of course, them leaving and going back to their host countries. But, but Turkey seems, you know, there's a lot of talk about the United States and Mexico, how porous the border is, is here with the U.S. It seems to me Turkey and Syria, that border is even more porous. How many of these people were able to get in and out, or is that really an issue, and is that an Achilles heel? Well, it's, it's really an issue, but I wouldn't compare it to the U.S. and Mexico in that we don't want our border to be porous, whereas Turkey is allowing their border to be used for this. You know, Turkey is very much uh, thrown in in the uh, anti-Assad coalition. Obviously, that's where the U.S. stands as well, so it's hard to be too critical for that. But one of the things that they've decided to do to try to dispatch Assad uh, more quickly is to allow fighters to transit through southern Turkey. It's very clear that Turkey is being very permissive of fighters going to the battlefield. They're even okay with the fact that fighters are going to extremist organizations. What about the UN's actions this week? Did they do much in your estimation? It, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, when you look at uh, a lot was said, uh, but already you'd had European countries that were moving towards um, a variety of foreign fighter policies. All of them recognize it as an issue, as does the United States. Um, so it, it remains to be seen if you'll get increased cooperation. But to me, the UN seems more than anything like a formalization of what had already been occurring. Let me ask one final question. Um, the Sarnayev uh, brothers, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, they didn't go to Syria. They went to Dagestan. Um, and, but, but it seemed like the information was out there. The NSA, of course, collects all this data. Isn't it really tough if these people go and then come back to the host country to catch them, nab them? Well, it, it's kind of a needle in a haystack in a sense, isn't it? If they come back to the United States? Um, well, not really, um, in, in the sense that um, 
that's where port security and um, making sure that that uh, the borders are tough. And and you know most people who who try to come back to the U.S. it's going to be through airports. It's not going to be coming in through the southern border. Um, so to that extent, the question is, do you have the intelligence to know that someone had gone over to Syria? That's really the key question. And the answer is, uh, in most cases, the U.S. will. But there have been cases where uh, the U.S. did not have enough intelligence. A young man named Abu Samra, who died as a suicide bomber fighting for Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliate, he had returned to the U.S. after he'd been in Syria, then went back to Syria and died as a suicide bomber. That was clearly a case where the U.S. did not have the intelligence. All right, David, always a pleasure seeing you in here. Thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate it.